Alrighty, back to chapter three. Um, okay, when I do these lectures, sometimes I'm really going to follow the textbook pretty closely. And, and like chapter two was an example of that, where mostly I was trying to make sure you were, you know, really getting everything you learned in chapter two. But sometimes the way to make you really understand what you're learning is to take some of those things you're learning and show how they all come together in a specific context. And that's what I want to do over both this and the lecture that follows. Okay, so this one is going to be understanding anxiety. Um, this is something I always talked about. Um, in fact, uh, the next lecture I'll call the uh, psychology of being cool, uh, which is really the psychology of managing your anxiety response. Um, and so I always used to give these in, in classes anyway, uh, as part of my lectures. And when the pandemic hit and we were all feeling so anxious, myself included, I created a course for the general public to help them understand and manage their anxiety. And to the extent you might see me on TV or, or you know, such in the media now, it's largely because of that course, that course course 200,000 people have gone through it all around the globe it's generated a lot of um, attention uh, for lack of a better word and has given me some opportunities to work with the Toronto Police Services to work with um, people in the healthcare profession and such which is which is really cool um, so it's been on my mind a lot I guess is what I'm saying and I think this is relevant to the situation we're in um, so that you guys can all get a sense of what you've gone through in the last two years what that has done to you what's happening in your body as we all deal with threats and you know why it's important to learn some good strategies for managing anxiety because you can manage it. In order to understand those strategies and why they would work, why they make sense, we have to start by understanding the anxiety response in the first place. That's what this lecture will be about. Okay, so let's jump in. Um, so first of all, when we talk about anxiety, you can talk about it at different levels, and you'll see some of that kind of come and go as we do this lecture. You know, literally the physical level of what people feel, things like their hearts pounding, flushing on the cheeks sometimes, shortness of breath, dizziness, sweating, headache, dry mouth, etc. goes on and on and on here. Um, those are all normal reactions, and, and they will make sense in, in just a moment as we talk through what's happening. We'll kind of come back to this and think about that. Um, but these also give rise to psychological symptoms like excessive worry, irritability, impatience, feeling on edge, um, vivid dreams, which is kind of interesting, eh? but mind racing, mind going blank, indecisiveness, difficulty concentrating, decreased memory. You'll understand why some of those things happen uh, in just a moment as well. Uh, and that can also change the way we behave, the way we interact. Um, so, you know, we can become obsessive or compulsive. We can become phobic. We can start to avoid certain situations um, that we associate with stress. We can feel distress when we're in a, a social context um, because of our anxiety. So, you know, for one thing, this gives you a good example of how you can take a psychological thing like anxiety and really think about it at different levels of analysis. These are three different levels of analysis. Um, but it also, when we try to tell the story of anxiety, you know, we want to see, well, why does all this stuff happen? How does that all make sense? Um, so I literally, I, I'm now thinking I should have put the slide at the end of this lecture too. So we could have come back to it. I may back up to come back here and do just that. Um, if we really focus on the psychological, there are the things that it says on the left here. And if we just talk about general categories of what people report, you know, they can report worry, dread, and apprehension. They can report feeling trapped. Who hasn't felt trapped during the pandemic? Irritability and anger. You'll find out why. Um, mood swings, you know, going from irritability and anger to maybe something much more nice and peerful, uh, peaceful, peerful peaceful, um, fearful and tense. Uh, at times I was already reading fearful when I said fearful. Anyway, uh, emotionally tired and tearful. So there's a tearful there, a fearful and a tearful. Excellent. Um, you know, we're seeing emotionality being strong here, anger and, and fear and various other sort of negative emotions that are really dominating our mind. And that wears us down when emotionally tired. So we're going to talk that all through. And I, and I want to give you a little bit of an evolutionary perspective. So this is going to be a bit of an example of where evolution theory can inform current psychology um, and some of the interesting things we see. So let's start here. Um, we have pretty small brains. They're about two pounds. And like me, for example, I'm a 180 pound body. So I've got a two pound brain that's controlling this 180 pound 
body. It's getting information from the body, from the senses, like, you know, the hand, when you touch things, that, that goes to your brain, the, the feeling from your fingertips all the way up to your brain lets you know what you're what it is that you're interacting with. Also from the brain to the body, um, the brain sends commands for our muscles to get us to do our things and, and such. Um, but also here's what we're really going to focus on today. The brain has um, an early warning system. Um, do I talk directly about the amygdala? I'm not sure, but there's a part of the brain that all sense information goes through and it's part of the primitive brain. We'll, we'll show, I'll show you the primitive brain in a moment. We'll look for the amygdala. We should be able to see it. Um, and the amygdala is analyzing the input for threat. It's looking for danger. Uh, that's its job. It's continually out there looking for something that's trying to hurt, harm us, or in some way threaten us. When it detects that threat, and especially if the threat's significant, but it doesn't have to be very significant. Um, it can be even just social embarrassment. Uh, if it detects a threat, it kicks us into this different mode. And it does this for a good reason. It's a sort of superhero mode. Um, and the idea is it's making us ready to take on that threat. And this mode makes a whole lot of sense in the context in which it evolved. And it still helps us quite a bit now, sometimes. But sometimes it causes problems as well. So that's the story we're going to tell. You can think of it in two ways. So, so sometimes I like to tell, tell people, this is a story about the two of you, because there's two of you. Um, you might not really think that there's two of you, but there kind of is. And a lot of human psychology and the behavior is a result of how these two of you dance. Um, so I, I have a couple of analogies here. Here's one analogy. Spider-Man, you know, Peter Parker, regular normal dude. Um, you could interact with him. He'd be calm and chill. But if he senses danger, if his spider sense is tingling, that's like our amygdala. If your spider sense is tingling, then he goes into superhero mode, right? And he puts on this outfit and he now has abilities that he doesn't have as Peter Parker. Um, that's going to be kind of the same story for you, kind of, but it's less this and more this. <laughs> so what's this? This is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, and the idea, if you go back and read Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, a lot of these literary books, um, they connect with people so deeply because they capture a, a truth about us in some way. And the truth in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde was basically saying that within every civilized human being, Dr. Jekyll, very civilized, upstanding citizen, there lurks a Mr. Hyde. And Dr. Jekyll would drink a potion and he would transform into Mr. Hyde. And Mr. Hyde was a much more primitive version of himself, um, had very specific, you know, goals and, and et cetera. Um, and that's kind of like us, you know, we have our civilized us that we, that we wear out there, but when we detect threat, a more primitive version of us emerges and often takes over. Um, and that can be for good at times, and that can be for ill. Um, and so, Let's talk about that. So did you know there was two of you? There's two of you. Um, that's kind of cool. So let me introduce you to these two. And let's start with Mr. Hyde. Let's start with that primitive one. Um, when In brain terms, like as you're going through the chapter, we'll usually refer to this as the limbic system. And there's the amygdalas right there. We have one there. There'll be one on the other side too. Um, so there's one on each side. So you see one here and you see one over there kind of tucked in there. Um, little almond-shaped things, again, that look at all the input that comes in looking for threat. And then they'll kick in other parts of this system. So the point we're making here is the same system. Here's how it is in a human being. And here's how it is in a rat. Uh, rat brain. Human brain, rat brain. And the point made here is all of the same structures are there. And while they're a little different in terms of their organization, maybe their shape and certainly their size, Generally speaking, the system is present, this limbic system, and it's present in virtually every animal. And it is because it plays a critical role. It keeps the animal alive in times of danger. It helps us to deal with, um, yeah, things that want to kill us um, and even things much lesser than that. It has generalized to be uh, to, to support a response to threat 
that is really a, a massively powerful thing. Um, so at any rate, this is the first part. It's your limbic system. This system is old. Okay, it has evolved with us. The fact that we see it in every animal suggests that its genesis was before the animals started to diverge to become all these different animals. Um, you know, it is a very, very primitive brain system, a very important one. And when push comes to shove, it takes over. Okay, so Hyde, I'll tell you about this other system in a second, but Hyde's kind of like, hey, when the chips are down, leave it to me. I know what to do. Get out of my way. I will take over managing this body. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, okay, so there's Hyde, the much more primitive version of yourself. Who's Dr. Jekyll? Well, Dr. Jekyll would be your frontal lobes in a brain series. So the limbic system is Mr. Hyde. The frontal lobes is Dr. Jekyll. And first thing to note, the frontal lobes, evolutionarily speaking, are new. Um, I mean, not that new, obviously, generations, generations, and generations, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But in the evolutionary time frame, um, the frontal lobes are new and they're really what differentiate us. So if we look, if we skip down here and look at various animals, and now we go to the rat and the cat, you know, we're not seeing hardly any frontal lobes there. And what that means is that these are largely still primitive creatures. They are reacting to the environment they find themselves in, in relatively reflexive ways, because that primitive part of the system deals with reflexes and habits and that sort of way. The frontal lobes deal with our, our strategic thinking, our rational thought, you know, everything Rene Descartes loved. <laughs> that was his frontal lobes working, right? And so this is where we do our planning. This is where we, you know, strategize about, you know, how to best study the material to do well on the exam. You know, that's all of our frontal lobes. Oh, that reminds me. I owe you guys a video about that. Okay. Um, note to self. So um, yeah, and when we look at different species, again, as we go to the primates, we see more and more frontal lobe. And when we come to the humans, you know, this is what we really have. This is the differentiator of us with other animals. We have much bigger frontal lobes, much more complexly wired frontal lobes. And that's why we're able to do things like build cities and, and et cetera. You know, that takes a lot of, of formal strategic thinking, you know, problem solving, rationalizing, all that kind of stuff. That's frontal lobe work. Okay. Um, the frontal lobes also, by the way, you'll learn more about this because we're going to talk about them in a little more detail, but they're also very important in terms of inhibiting behaviors that are inappropriate. So you kind of, we're starting to get the dance between Hyde and, and Jekyll here. So for example, during the pandemic, you know, Hyde had this habit. Um, we've had this habit for years and years. When we meet somebody, we reach our hand out and say, hey, great to meet you. It's a little ritual. It's a, it's a way humans kind of, you know, interact with each other. When the pandemic hit, we were told not to do that. Okay. So now, you know, during the pandemic, if someone reaches out the hand, the hide within us wants to reach out our hand and shake it. You know, that's the habit. That's the emotionally warm thing to do, the right way to greet somebody in it for a social critter. And it's still wanting to do that, but our frontal lobes are like, hey, don't be doing that. And so our frontal lobes now are inhibiting that reflexive, natural, primitive behavior. It's not that primitive to shake someone's hand, but it's, but it's a habitual behavior now. And this is what our frontal lobes do. Sometimes we have this thought, Oh, I should say, Oh no, I shouldn't say that. Oh, that joke wouldn't work well in this situation. So our frontal lobes are gatekeepers often to, per, to, to literally make sure we are civilized to make sure that our behavior is in line with social norms. Even if our thoughts and ideas aren't, you know, even if we come, Oh, I want to do this. Oh no, no, don't do that here. So it's what keeps us civilized. The frontal lobes are the civilized human sort of part of us. And well, the rational human part of us, not the emotional human part. Hyde is the emotional human part, which is very important to our humanity. Um, but there are these two sides, that sort of emotional part of you, the limbic system, the much more rational frontal lobes. Okay, so if we have that set, now let's take it to the next step. Wow, what the heck is this? Okay, there's a whole lot of color here, a whole lot of whatever, but I can explain it in a, in a pretty basic way. Here's your brain up here. I said your brain has your whole body to control. How does it do that? It does that through some nerve cells that connect the brain to the body from the spinal cord, but it also does a lot of it through the release of hormones that put the body into certain states. 
Um, so releasing literally chemicals, drugs, hormones are neurotransmitters that work on a longer distance scale, right? Neurotransmitters work in those synaptic clefts, those little things. Hormones work on the level of the body. So they're released by our glands, controlled by our pituitary, um, and they release these chemicals, these hormones into our body. And that puts our body into one of two states. And you have to be in one of these two almost all the time. The default, the normal state, the one we spend the vast majority of our time in, they call it here relaxation and digest. I like rest and digest. Sounds a little funkier. Uh, so the rest and digest mode. And so what's going on in the rest and digest mode, you know, basically as stated, is when you're chilling out, when you're kind of resting, then what your body prioritizes is processes of digestion. It's essentially taking the food you ate, separating the nutrients from the waste, delivering the nutrients to your body, to your muscles and your organs to keep them strong and healthy, getting rid of the waste. Um, and so you can almost think of this as long-term survival, long-term body maintenance, right? Keeping your body strong, um, keeping it healthy. Very cool. But now if you're sitting on that couch, relaxing, and let's say you're home alone, your body's in rest and digest, everything's heavenly, but now let's imagine you have a basement and let's imagine you hear the window smash in the basement. What happens? Your amygdala hears that and it immediately says, danger, um, th there's a potential threat here, and it flips a switch which releases a bunch of different hormones, especially cortisol and adrenaline, uh, releases those hormones, which changes everything here. In fact, it almost flips it. Well, it does flip it into an almost exactly opposite state of being. For example, when we're resting, our pupils are sort of constricted. And in fact, our sort of attention to the world is sort of just minimal. But when we hear that danger sound, we become hypertentive to the world. So we see our pupils dilate, but also our hearing and everything becomes like really attuned to what's going on. What am I hearing? What am I seeing? We're, so we can become very attuned to the external world. Our muscles tense up. Okay. These are important things. Our heart rate speeds up. Um, and it's, it's not, I, I don't know why they don't have the breathing listed here because the breathing is always a, an absolutely critical one. In rest and digest, we take long, deep breaths, right? In fight or flight, and I haven't told you yet, this is fight or flight, but when we get into that fight or flight, that's shorter, um, faster breathing. <laughs> so closer to a panting kind of thing. What is going on there is when you pant like that and your heart is beating fast, what's going on is your heart is now pumping oxygen rich blood to your body. So your oxygen, <laughs> that's adding oxygen to the blood. And then the heart beating fast is pumping that blood out to your body, especially to your muscles, getting that oxygen rich blood out to them. Our bodies, as you'll learn, kind of work off of oxygen. Oxygen is kind of the energy of all of the, all of the parts of our body. Um, when we look at fMRIs, we're going to follow the oxygen as it, as it moves around the brain. But in this case, the oxygen is going to your muscles. Now, what does that do? For one thing, you can feel it, right? You, you get that, you get a little bit of a, a tingle, I guess you'd call it. Um, you can feel your muscles tense. And what's really going on here, by the way, your digestive system is shutting down. It's like, forget about digestion. It's not important right now. What is important is this issue that we have to solve. And so you also, in your mind, feel compelled to do something. And often it's down to this, fight or flee. There's that crash in the basement. I'm either going to go down there and take it on, whatever that is, including maybe an intruder, or I'm going to choose this as a good time to go out and go somewhere else. Like I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave this house, whatever, whoever's down there. I don't want anything to do with it. I'm getting the heck out of here. Okay. That's the fight or flee kind of response. No matter which of those you choose, it's really handy that your body is super strong, right? Because if you're going to take on that threat, you want to be at your best. If you're going to try to run away from it, you still want to be at your best. That's what's going on here. You're, you're being put into a sort of superhero mode where you're really strong, but you're also really dumb. <laughs> dumb is the wrong word. But when you go into this mode, your, your frontal lobes kind of go offline and your limbic system kind of takes over. 
So it really is Hyde kind of saying, listen, Jekyll, out of the way. We don't need any of your fancy rational thinking right now. There's danger afoot. We have to act and we're going to fight that danger. We're going to get the heck away from it. Don't bog this down with heavy thought. Now, I will be clear. Some people talk about fight, flight, freeze, as you see here. Um, free sometimes, especially animals, but humans as well in these situations will freeze. They'll literally be, and they're basically stuck between fight or flee right? They feel this compel, they feel everything I've just talked about, but they're not sure whether the best course of action is to take that thing on or get the heck out of there. And so sometimes they get stuck in that for a while. And we call that freeze. And they're basically gathering information, trying to assess the best course of action. Okay. Um, but we usually boil it down to fight or flee because that's what ultimately happens is a fight or flee. But that's almost all that Hyde's world is about. It's not subtle nuances. It's not complicated stuff. It's like, there's a danger. I'm going to go after it. I'm going to get away from it. It's a very primitive version of yourself. Okay, that's that evolved to work that way because it really helped us in a lot of situations. This is one you hear about every now and then. Um, you hear about a situation. The story here would be, here's a police officer. She was on her normal beat. She was walking around and she hears a commotion. She comes around the corner and sees a child trapped under the car. Now, the first thing you might say was, well, that's not a danger to her. And it's not. But this is where we want to talk about how general this is. There is, there is a danger to her. Her job is to protect the community. Here's a member of the community who is in danger, who is in help, sorry, who needs help. If she just ignores it or walks away, um, that's a threat to her. She's going to get in trouble for doing that. That's not what she's supposed to do. She is supposed to be there to help and she wants to help well. So she wants to go there and do something that makes a positive difference because that is her job. And if she screws it up, that's not going to be good. So there's a threat for her too in that situation. Plus she feels the empathy with the child and this will all kick off her fight or flight. I have to do something. This is a fight reaction. She's going towards that and doing something. And what is she doing? She's lifting a heavy vehicle by the engine side. This is where the engine is. This is the heaviest part of the vehicle. And you would say, uh, a woman can't lift a vehicle like that. And you would be right most of the time when her fight or flight is engaged, you know, despite the like shock and awe uh, evident in the faces, when her fight or flight is engaged, then we're capable of doing things like that. And that's why it's there. Simplify the thinking, just do what you got to do. And here's all this extra power to get it done with. Okay. So that's very useful in situations like this. That's where it evolved. It evolved when we were hunting and gathering and that bear steps out and we have to either fight that bear or get the heck away from it, right? And we have this power, this strength to do it. It keeps us alive. The system keeps us alive when these threats hit us. However, there's a really important distinction to make. I've been talking so far about this from an acute stress point of view, like my bear popping out. When that bear pops out, it's, it's what's called an acute stress. And what we mean is it wasn't there. Now it's there. We're going to deal with it. And once we deal with it, it won't be there anymore. So it's something that pops up and then goes away. So with the bear, it's popping up. We're going to decide to fight or flee. I'm not sure fighting would be a good idea against that, that dude. But we're going to make that decision. Uh, we either fight or flee, assuming we don't die. And we might, but assuming we live through it, you know, we either scared that bear away and he went running away from us or we successfully ran away from him. Either way, at some point in time, it's over. Okay. And this whole fight flee reflex that we just had can dissipate back to rest and digest. That's how it's supposed to work. That's how our ancient world worked. The stressors tended to be acute. Um, they tended to pop up like that. And this system is there to help us in that situation. We have things in modern life kind of like that. Here's a few examples. I'll just pick one presentation at school, let's say. So let's say you had to do an oral presentation, get up in front of your student, your classmates and give a presentation. You would likely, you would say you felt anxious or nervous. This fight or flee is anxiety. 
We're going to get to that point a little bit more, but that is anxiety. And so what you would be feeling is everything I just described because there's a threat there, right? You, you don't want to be embarrassed in front of other people. You want them to like you. This is not a skill that you're necessarily feeling super competent at. You haven't done it a whole lot yet. And so there's a threat involved in, in going up in front of people and messing it up. Uh, and so your amygdala detects that, oh, you're about to go into a dangerous situation. Now notice this isn't a bear, right? This is just social embarrassment, but it, the brain doesn't care. That's a threat. And so you feel all of those feelings I've talked about, uh, and you hopefully use those in a sort of fight mode to attack that presentation and to really kind of do your best. Again, one way or another, however well you do, at some point that presentation's over. You can go back to your chair. Um, you might be still buzzing a little bit from all that um, adrenaline and cortisol, that's in your system. That's what stress releases. Um, but you, know, you can slowly relax and get back to rest and digest. Um, so that's, you know, a, 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 a modern version of the bear. Okay. The problem though, is the modern world is full of these kinds of stresses, chronic stresses, things that don't go away, a bad relationship, a stressful job, a toxic home environment. You know, if you go home and all you do is argue with your parents all the time, my goodness, every day you go home, it's another argument. Every day is another argument. Then this is a stress that just continues. And here's some other examples of that. Um, and by the way, here's an example we've all have been dealing with for two plus freaking years. Um, COVID, and not just COVID itself, but the stress that comes with that, learning online instead of learning face-to-face, etc. Our world's been kind of turned upside down, and every day we wake up, this sucker's still there. It's still dangerous. Maybe not as dangerous um, as it was, but it's still dangerous. It's still mysterious. We don't really know how to fight it well, how, how to flee it, um, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. It's like we wake up every morning, open our eyes, and there's the bear, and the bear ain't leaving. Okay, this is what we call chronic stress. And what this means is that your fight-flight reflex is chronically active. It's continuing to hum along, and that's not good. Um, work from Hans Selye, a Canadian um, physiologist, really, I think, physiologist slash psychologist from Montreal, um, really looked at this. And this was, by the way, Groundbreaking research because it really showed how the mental world and the physical world interact. He looked at people who were living under chronic stress and at different points of their exposure to the stressor. And what he found was this. Um, if something happens that causes stress, you see alarm, there's a, there's a little bit of a, of a, la uh, a negative hit to resistance, but very quickly. We rise to the challenge when we first encounter that stressor. So imagine early days of COVID. We're like, okay, this COVID is scary. And so we're feeling the anxiety. There's nothing here that says we're not feeling the anxiety. We're feeling the anxiety, but we're like, okay, what do we need to do? How do we do it? Blah, blah, blah. Let's give me information. Let me learn about this thing. Let me fight it. And so we're able to, to resist the, the negative effects of the chronic stress for quite a while. And we're quite pretty good at rising to them. But if it continues and continues and continues, we reach a point where, we, where the resistance starts to fail. And we go from being highly anxious to what we would colloquially call burnt out or exhausted. And we kind of talk, this talks you through those, those stages. Let's just look at resistance versus exhaustion. Those are the, the more interesting ones. So in the resistance, cortisol is released and all unnecessary functions are shut down. Individual appears as though all is normal. So they kind of look like all is normal, but they have this cortisol in their body and they're stressed. They're, they, they, they are anxious. Um, one of the differences we're going to talk about is when you're in this resistance mode, you feel energized. You feel like you need to do something. You don't always know what that is. It's an uncomfortable feeling, anxiety. Um, it's not really that dangerous, not compared to what could happen when you reach burnout or exhaustion. So this is a point where our resources are just depleted. Look at this. The immune system is weakened. This is what Hans Selye showed. People living under stress get sick more. The mental stress, what's going on in your mind, affects your physical body and you get sick more. This was the first sort of mind-body 
demonstration of how those two are intimately connected and that our mind can affect our body and our body obviously can affect our mind. Um, so yeah, when our resources are depleted, the immune system is weakened and the prolonged release of adrenaline has negative effects on the body. So this cortisol and adrenaline continuing to pour into our body starts to wear our body down and it wears us down psychologically as well. And we become exhausted. Okay. Or as we'll say, burnt out. This is hard because the difference in this line is one between I need to do something uh, to why bother? Nothing matters. There's nothing we can do. So this starts to bring us to more like a depressed mindset as opposed to an anxious and depressed mindsets are scary and dangerous. Anxious mindsets are uncomfortable. This is dangerous when people get really depressed. So, um, What's this all say? Well, chronic anxiety is a really dangerous thing uh, and we need to find some ways to mitigate it. I'm gonna look at the next slide, which I think might be a lack of slide, but I'm not sure. Okay, no, 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 okay, there's this slide and then I'm gonna go, go back to that first one just to tie it together. So what I want you to just kind of think about what I've talked about is we have the fight or flight. There's an appearance of threat. The brain goes, oh, there's danger and it releases adrenaline and cortisol, which then cause all of those effects, okay? These psychological effects that I talked about are really due to the prolonged release of adrenaline and cortisol. It, they are chemicals in our body that produce all of this stuff. I am going to next tell you some ways you can manage anxiety. And part of that will involve finding ways to, to, to promote the release of other hormones, hormones that counter the effects of adrenaline and cortisol uh, so that there are things you can do that are medicinal. They, they will flood your body with positive drugs, hormones or drugs, that will counter the effects of anxiety. So it's important to know these are the villains right over here, adrenaline and cortisol. When they're released, you know, Hyde comes out and, and sort of takes over. Um, and so now if we go back, so now I'm going to run all the way back to the beginning here. Hang on, hang on. Let's go back here. Let's look at this again now. And, you know, hopefully a lot of this makes sense. The physical, this is everything I told you about the fight or flight. The heart pounding faster, the flushing, that's because blood is being put all through your body so that can show on your cheeks. You can flush shortness of breath. You just breathe <laughs> more panty-like. Dizziness, that's just part of the game. I don't know, sweating because your body is getting ready to fight or flee and it's, so it's getting its cooling system kicked in. The sweating system cools us when we're in you know high energy and so it's starting to say, oh, you're about to fight or flee. I'm gonna start cooling you already. And then there are these other things that don't follow so directly, but a lot of them, nausea, diarrhea, this is because your digestive system is shutting down, stomach pains, dry mouth, actually all of these are your digestive system shutting down. Uh, muscle aches or pains, restlessness, inability to relax. You know, this is because your muscles are being filled with all this uh, oxygen-rich blood. So all of these physical things are just the fight-flight reflex. These psychological things go along with it now. And so when you see some of these things, mind going blank, indecisiveness, dis difficulty concentrating, decreased memory, that is your frontal lobes not being effective. Your frontal lobes getting kind of shut down. Um, and that's why you do that. Feeling on edge, that's just all of this, right? That kind of makes you there. Impatience, irritability, often again, our frontal lobes would help us to be not irritable. Um, you know, we'd be nicer and politer to people. And one of the things we've seen during the pandemic is a sort of loss of just basic human decency towards each other now and then. And that's because we're coming from Hyde. You know, we're often, it's, it's the Hyde. When you, when you looked at those people that were on the freedom demonstrations, if you watched any of those videos, you're seeing Hyde. Man, they are, they are scared. They are worried about themselves and their own, you know, survival. And you're blocking my freedom and blah, 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 blah. It's Hyde. Uh, and that's what happens when the, when the emotions run wild and the frontal lobes are not there to kind of keep things under control. Um, behaviorally, I mean, we won't talk too much about it, but, but, but you get some of that stuff. So, I mean, these two are the easier levels to connect. Okay, cool. So let's just sort of 
shut that one down and just say the following. So the hope is in this lecture, first of all, you're, you're going to hear about some of those brain systems that I talked about in the limbic system, and we're going to get to the frontal lobes. And so this gives you a sense of how the brain is all dancing together to produce, you know, behavior and such. Um, but I also want you, you know, now that you have that basic understanding, the brain detects threat, it releases these hormones um, to help us face that threat. But if those hormones are continually released for too long, bad things happen. So with that last point, in the next lecture, I'll say, okay, obviously we cannot allow ourselves to be continually under stress. What can we do to take control of this a little bit, um, to actually be in control of what's on our mind and how it's affecting our body? That's what we'll do in lecture three, four.